Hello, investors. Uh, thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to discuss uh, episode three of um, how Beginners Investors, and we're going to talk about uh, portfolio management, but we're going to essentially focus on position sizing. Um, my name is Michael from Deep Value Returns on Seeking Alpha. I run a premium newsletter where we talk about hybrid portfolios. This is the kind of way you split the portfolio into half, high growth names that are really market leaders. And then we kind of split the rest of the portfolio into low growth, very much traditional value stocks. Over to you, Manuel. Hi, thank you, Michael. And my name is Manuel Mauricio, and you can find all my work at allinstocks.com. So let's do it, Michael. How are you today? I'm great, man. You've got an awesome radio voice. You know that, yeah? It's a very, very smooth, <laughs> well, jazzy radio voice. Um, okay. Thank you. So, I can, uh, let, mm -hmm. Have you been working on it? Is that what you said? <laughs> no. um, yeah. So basically, last week, we kind of talked about uh, how to exit a position. And I think that was a really great podcast. We kind of talked about from different angles. Uh, myself, in the way that I'm more kind of short-term oriented and looking at holding a position for, let's say, about a year, year and a half. And Manuel talked about how some of his great ideas for the next, uh, even you know, five years ahead, are really only starting to show fruition in the second year. So be sure to check out that podcast. So anyway, uh, just to kind of open it up, um, today we're going to talk about position sizing. And this is something that comes up quite a lot. So a lot of times investors kind of get really infatuated with the, like, the new thing. Something comes up and it's like really, really attractive. But as you become more of a more of a professional investor, you really learn that investing is a lot about meeting that kind of being very, very patient, that you cannot speed up investing with being very, very willing to act when the opportunity shows itself. So with that in mind, it's the way that you invest is a very, very personal journey. And I think that what defines the investor is really how many stocks the person has in a portfolio and how a person builds a position over time. So for example, for me, I, we can afterwards talk about Manuel, but for me, I'm very much looking at putting 3% of my portfolio into an interesting idea. And then I wait and I wait 30 days or 45 days because I'm not holding the position for that longer period of time, but I really, really want to see learn a lot about the company because once you are the owner of a business and you own a share of apple or whatever you may think you know apple you may know everything there is how to operate an iphone but the second that you buy a share of apple you start thinking much more like a business owner you start to think okay how is the services side of the business going to deliver strong runway ahead how is the service side of the business going to be improving the profit margin profile going ahead over the next two, three years? How is the investor going to look in three years' time at that business? And why am I buying today that business at a slight discount to where the person is going to be buying it from me in three years' time? And you learn a lot more, but only once you've been the owner of the business. Because until you own the business, it's like buying a house. You can know everything you want to know about buying the house. You look at the neighborhood, you look at the schools, you look at the, the commute, you look at the, everything to do with like the statistics. But until you moved into the house and you've been in the house for about a month, you don't really know much about the house. And it's, it's that familiarity that you really build and you gain that quite quickly, but you don't gain it until you've owned the position. After you've owned the position, you really, you can then look for reasons why your thesis may or may not be right. So a book that we kind of talked about in, in a podcast a few last time, we talked about super forecasting. And in super forecasting, um, uh, Tel Telok, I think is name, Philip Telok, I think his name is, he talks about how you can become a super forecaster simply by being able to optimize and adjust your thesis over time. So you, I believe it's important to start small and not to be too slow in the sense to kind of put 3% now and then maybe 3% in a year's time because you want to be really selective. When you find something that you want to invest, it has to be something meaningful. There are 3,000 stocks at any one point in time that are compelling. You need to find the best one and you need to be able to act when an opportunity presents itself. So you have to kind of marry that up slightly. 
be, between having very much action, being action driven and being very patient in waiting for the valuation to make sense for you. And one more thing that I wanted to say, and this is something that has kind of been going on in my mind for a little while, and it's quite interesting, is that it's not good enough to buy into a great business. It's not good enough. And it's not good enough even to buy into a great business when the valuation has come down. I think what's actually quite interesting is to buy into a great business when the valuation has come down, but more importantly, when you can see that the share price over the last, let's say, several months has gone into correction territory. Correction territory means when the stock has fallen more than 20% from its highs. So when you see that dip and you start building your position and then you wait for a quarterly result where you see that there's a strong vindication that everyone is back on back in favor with this company. You can see this many times with, let's say, some cyclical stocks, um, even, even non-cyclical stock like the NVIDIA. Sometimes you see that there's a period where NVIDIA kind of slows down and investors are kind of despondent and they kind of go into correction territory and you kind of start building a position. And then there's a quarterly result where it's just basically shining again. And you see that, that quite strong re-rating. And you can see that the stock goes up 10, 15% in a quarter. And you can see that over, if you look back over the next six months, you can see that the share price, that moment is quite attractive. Uh, so that's how I kind of want to build my position in summary. In summary, I'm looking to start something small and I'm looking to get confirmation without being looking for confirmation bias. But you want to see objectively that there's more information coming at you that leads you to see, okay, yes, I think I was right. I'm looking that I'm more right. And then you kind of get another update, another quarterly result, either next quarter or in six months time. And you can see, yes, this is what I felt. And I can see that it's blowing through my expectations. And if it's blowing from my expectations, it's blowing for everyone else's expectations too. And you can kind of build that position up to about five, eight percent of your portfolio or something thereabouts. And you want to let the investment grow into a 10 or 12 percent 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 of your portfolio. So the idea is to really let the compounding happen on your behalf, because ultimately everything boils down to rule number one. Rule number one is you really just don't want to lose capital. So you don't want to go and put 10 percent and then kind of have to get out of the position because you're wrong. You want that capital to grow as the business grows. Uh, how would you see? Because I know sometimes you have a different point of view, Manuel. How, how do you kind of uh, feel about it? Well, that, there's, there's a lot to talk about here because we're talking about position sizing, about when to buy, when when to sell as well, when to average up, when to average down. Um, there's, there's a lot, a lot of, we can spawn this, all of these subjects for further episodes. Um, but prior to talking about how I view it, I, I wanted to understand a little bit better how, how do you do it? How concentrated are you? Uh, like, uh, how, how many stocks do you own on average and the, the bigger ones, the largest ones, um, what's their, their size or their relative weight? So the way that I do it, I, I, my background, I'm very much uh, numbers driven. So I've got 15 stocks in the portfolio, but five of them make up 50% of the portfolio. So how the top five will do pretty much as will basically lead to fame and fortune or disaster. It's really about those five. But then in the other positions, there are things that I'm either building into or coming away from. So I'm really looking, it's the top five that really, so each one of those positions is approximately 10%. And I'm always kind of looking for building that up to 10%. But I'm, in my mind, I'm always very mindful that what matters in investing is that you save the capital deployed. You need to stay in the game for as long as possible. You need to, to, to play the investment game for about 20 years. So what rule number one, Buffett's rule number one is, is don't lose capital. And that's really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make sure that when I deploy that capital, that 10%, I'm building a margin of safety over time. So is, this is kind of like, I suppose, I've kind of gone full circle. I've kind of gone from, let's say, being a, a young stock picker just looking for like stuff that's priced below a dollar and kind of seeing a jump and yeah, 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 you know, and not, not thinking about the market cap of the company. And I've gone to being a, a Buffett-like disciple and now I've kind of gone around and I'm kind of like, you know, 
I'm, I'm grateful for those mentors, mentors, but I'm kind of going on on my own journey. And I'm just thinking to myself that I'm trying to optimize for my strategy right now. And what Buffett was doing in the 60s, even 50s, you know, he was like even late 40s, he had an information edge because there weren't that many eyeballs doing this kind of things. And it'd be quite interesting to see how Buffett would do in 2021, 2022, when everyone has SEC filings, everyone has the data at your footstep in your inbox in the morning, everyone has the same information. So it's quite difficult to not adapt. You have to adapt. If you want to stay relevant in this game, you have to adapt. So I'm really looking towards saving that capital and really deploying it, but not losing the capital that I've invested. So let me just explain that a bit better. So you put down a little bit of your capital. Let that share price go up a little bit to build a little bit of a margin of safety so that when you're averaging up, you're kind of dragging your, your average cost up as well. You kind of want to be averaging up. You don't want to, many people, you know, uh, do the traditional kind of value thing where the share price has fallen, they buy a bit more and they kind of average down, average down. And that kind of is very high risk because you kind of send in more capital after a losing position and you're hoping that everything that you said is right and that the, it works out very favorably and then everything rallies back up and it mean reverts or regression to the mean or there's different terms to this. And I, I find that's really high risk. So that's how I used to do that. And I was a passionate bull and I could, just as I'm passionate to you, Manuel, right now today about what I'm doing, I was equally as passionate about that strategy in the past. Ah, this is gonna work out, this is gonna work out. And it didn't. And today I'm doing this and in six months time, it's not gonna work out and I'll be just as passionately saying the new version. But I ultimately believe that investing is a lot more about avoiding losers. I'm looking for, you know, there's the, the Peter Lynch quote that uh, long shots become no shots. So I'm not going for the high risk anymore. I'm really trying to position size into things that I think, okay, this is so likely to be a winner. This is, you know, I'm not going to lose a lot. It might not do very well, but I'm not, I, I'm not going to lose a lot because I'm really trying to preserve that capital. How, how do you see things? How do you position size? I'm not that different from you. Um, and I currently hold 11 stocks on the Elden Stocks portfolio and there's some cash, I would say like 30% cash still. Um, still because the portfolio began uh, right at the, the bottom of the coronavirus um, crash. So I seized the opportunity to start my the subscription then. And I'm slowly deploying cash. I was in no hurry and I'm still in no hurry to deploy cash. So I still have a, a lot of cash to deploy. But the I would say the top five stocks are also like 50% of the of the portfolio. And the other ones, the other day I was reading a post by Ian Castle from Microcap Club. And I, I see things, I'm highly influenced by him because I also typically like to go to look for stocks, uh, micro cap stocks, small companies. Not all of the companies that I own are micro cap, but that's, that's a space where I like to, to fish in. And he was saying that he looks at his portfolio like a baseball team or a football team or whatever team uh, where everyone's that there's some stocks in the bench which are the smallest positions and everyone's trying to uh, and you're the coach right and you're trying to figure out who's in better shape and if like an athlete grows older and his learning curve or his uh, his uh, average goes down you exchange him for a better a better one etc cetera, etc cetera. so you're you're always trying to figure out who's the winner in your bench and in, in the field and having said this, I do not mind. Um, there's a lot of people regarding your, your point on averaging down or averaging up. I do not mind. And I wish I could average up more often because that means that my thesis, and as I've told you before in the prior episode, I try to look for companies that grow over years. Uh, so I, I'm not constantly changing and finding new ideas. Um, so if the story plays out, if the management is doing their job, doing what they've set out to do, 
I don't mind. And I wish I am eager to average up. Not it doesn't happen all the time. Um, and it doesn't happen mostly because I when I'm confident of a stock, I put 10% of my portfolio in it. Typically, I put 5%, and then there are small ones who more of the long shots, there are the smaller positions. But when I put 10% and it doubles, it's already 20%. So it's not that easy to average up to put more capital at risk on, on those on those stocks. And I think I'm comfortable owning a stock which is 10, 20%. And then if it goes up more than that, that's something that I would also like your opinion on. Um, the, it, I think it will, it, it hasn't happened yet, but if it some of my if one single position grows to 40 or 50 percent i'm not sure what i will be doing it totally depends on the the how do you say on the opportunity if it's still there if i if i still feel that it's um, it's a good opportunity with low risk so i think i'll think about it when i get there in the meantime i'll, I'll be thinking about it um as well um and i'd like to understand if a position grows too big for your comfort, what, what do you do? So in the past, I used to have this idea that I was looking for a re-rating. I was looking for the stock to kind of just rally very significantly. And then I would take some of those, uh, some of that capital off the table. But now I'm trying to be doing that less. For you to find a winner is quite rare. And if you find something like, for example, I, I invested in Square, uh, just around uh, the start of the COVID period, it was a stock that worked out quite favorably for me. And it went up a lot, and then it kind of just flatlined. And it sucked. And, you know, it's kind of just been like that. But I look at something like Square right now, and I see that there's that culture of innovation that you just cannot replicate. And Yes, I mean, sometimes certain positions will get hypothetically to 20, 25, 30. Why should you punish your portfolio by because you happen to have had a moment of sunshine in your mind that you actually picked the winner? You shouldn't say, oh, I picked the next Amazon. No, I'm going to punish myself right now. And like, I'm, it's very difficult investing. And there are, you know, there, for every one rule, there's a contradiction and everything. What I have evolved to say is that if you happen to be lucky enough and pick the winner, take a 3% or 4% quote unquote dividend for yourself out of that position. If it just feels like, yeah, you know, I, I got to crystallize that. But being someone myself where I've invested in a company called FUBU, I invested it at, at like mid 28, 28 or something like that. And I saw it go up to $60. Oh my God, I was like, I was a hero, okay? So it was a huge position. It went up to $60. I was like, yeah. Then within a few days, it went to about 50, then 45, then 30, then 25 and 15. And I, I'm still on this stock. And I don't look back and say, oh, you know, uh, I should have taken that, you know, because you can't invest in hindsight with the facts that I had at the time at $60. And I even have better facts right now at its back at $28. And I said to myself, okay, yes, I could have, I should have, but you can't invest like that. Okay. I was so I saw an opportunity and I saw a business that I believe very strongly then at 60 and now at 28 again. And I'm not going to punish myself by ripping something out because I believe in that business. You know, nothing has changed. Just the old everything that's changed is the share price has kind of gone a bit high and it kind of had the overarching impact on my portfolio. But I'm not going to punish myself. I will try as much as possible to exit out of losing stocks. And I'm trying to just stay with winning stocks. So it, it if you're lucky have... enough to have you found the next Netflix, if you're lucky enough to find the next Amazon, if you're lucky enough, I just, yeah, just it's very difficult. And there's so many different voices, much more intelligent than me, saying it's overvalued. And I've often found that the biggest detraction that people say about the stock is A, that it's rallied very fast in a short amount of time, or B, if I look back to where the stock was two years ago, it's more expensive today. 
but that's it. No one's saying like that the business is not fundamentally performing well. No one's saying that like it's it hasn't got a market leading position. People are just saying, if I price anchor my mind to where it was in the past, it looks more expensive today. Well, yes, of course it's gonna look more expensive. It's a better business. It's it's grown, it's it's undervalued, is it's grown its fundamental performance, it's grown its intrinsic value. It's only right that it should be more expensively valued today. And what I often do is I have this rule. Let's say that the company is, let, pick a multiple. Let's say I want a price to gross profits or price to sales. If the price of sales is higher than the growth rate, then that's probably an overvalued stock. So I'll give you an example. Let's say um, I own a company and let's say it's, I don't own this company, but let's just say, for example, uh, the trade desk is priced at 32 times this year's sales and next year is priced at 22 times forward sales. So if you look out to next year, it's priced at 22 times forward sales. It's expected to grow at about 35 revenue growth rate. So it's not a stock that I'm particularly compelled about, but it's not a stock that I would say is overvalued. Now let's say another cybersecurity name. I don't want to kind of mention it by name, but let's say the cybersecurity name is growing at approximately 25% and it's priced at 50 times sales. I mean, like what's the upside for me? Yes. It, it can impress everyone, but from 55, 50 times sales, I mean, how much more it can go to, it, it could, but it's not likely to go to hundred times sales. I mean, there's a limit, trees don't grow to the sky. And if you look back to February 21, when many of these high flying names were really just flying high, and you see that from that point into May, this was like such a dramatic sell-off. And it just showed that, yes, there is a price that market leaders make sense. And there's a price where it doesn't make sense. And you just have to kind of, you know, if you're lucky enough that you've invested in a business and it's really grown to such a large position in your portfolio, if you've been that lucky, double check to see that the valuation still makes sense to someone buying the stock today. Because if you, Manuel, wouldn't buy the stock today, don't expect me, Michael, to buy it, right? If you're not gonna buy it at this valuation, don't expect me to. On the other side of the equation, if yeah. you would buy it, then you should expect me to buy it also. Um, if there are the, I own stocks that I wouldn't buy today, but I'm not selling as well. Okay, so that might be seen as a contradiction. I take that, and probably there that that's a, a fair point. Uh, but I own stocks that I wouldn't sell at. Uh, I wouldn't buy, and I'm not selling. Okay. And I've seen several guys, several investors and pretty good investors. I think it's one of the most common uh, regrets great investors um, have is selling too early. And there's even Monish Pabrai who says that he's looking to find stocks that can get ridiculously overvalued and you will only sell when they are ridiculously overvalued. And there's, there's a lot of them that mostly in this uh, corner of the market, which is compounding quality growth stocks. And almost all of them regret selling too early. Um, so I think for me, at least, I will own throughout my life a lot of stocks that I probably won't be buying at that, right, at that point in time, at that valuation, but I won't be selling um, Ada, you've mentioned uh, uh, one of two very interesting things. One, one is for every rule, for every one rule, there's a contradiction. I love that mm -hmm. one. Um, and you've mentioned, in an, in other words, the what what I usually talk about call the narrow set of outcomes. At least for me, the ones that there's a lot of um, ways to. To position sizing your or to size your positions. There are people who equal equal weight, but there's not a lot of them nowadays. I'm not a real fan of uh, equal weighting because that's what we do, right? We find out the best investment opportunities. Why would you we put five percent in this in, in a stock that we're convinced it's a great opportunity and 5% in a stock that we're not so sure about. So I think that they should be um, differently uh, weighted. And that does, does um, I, I would like in theory to buy more of the safest stocks of those that I will 
likely uh, lose the the lower amount of money or the probably probability of losing money is the lowest it, it doesn't happen all the time uh but i shift i do it uh another version of this which is a narrow set of outcomes right if i believe there is a really narrow set of outcomes for that company for instance i mentioned a company that that i believe is building a monopoly or a duopoly in, in the world so the set of outcomes is really is narrowing and i it's not my largest position and i bought a large position and then it got a deal with a larger company a distribution deal which narrowed even more the set of out, set of outcomes and then i bought more when that happened so that's one way that i like to do it it's not that the stock is a net net stock which would give me a a floor but the narrow the set of outcomes narrowed so much that uh, it it allowed me to get comfortable in um, buying more of it what's your do you follow this same principle when you buy your biggest uh, positions or why do you make them your biggest positions is it because you think you believe that the downside is well protected or because there's a lot more upside than the other smaller positions? So in the ideal situation, I want to buy into things nowadays. I'm moving towards things that I don't think I'm going to lose a lot. Let me, just, uh, yeah. let me just interrupt you. When you say nowadays, and I think for the, the, the name of this podcast is investing investment for beginners, let, let me just make it a, a investing or being an investor is learning all the time. Yeah. And uh, I've heard too that one should have strong opinions loosely held. So yeah. there's definitely a learning curve and we'll be throughout our lives learning and optimizing to our own own needs and to our own personality so just so people who are just starting out investing who, who might hear you and think well this guy is changing his uh, his way of investing yeah. this is the natural course of things you've got to learn and if you don't learn you're going to ruin yourself absolutely i mean so well explained i mean it's so true and i said my wife over the weekend even nowadays, when I look back to myself six months back, man, I'm still learning at such a fast rate. And I'm still very grateful for that. And I mean, I, I when I first started kind of keeping a track record, I would look back and I'll say, oh my God, I learned so much in the past six months. And I can't imagine that even now, after five years of holding a track record, I'm still saying, my God, I look back six months ago and I'm still going so much better, so much faster, learning, 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 learning. And um, when I'm, when I'm answering your question, when I'm looking to build a position, I'm really looking towards something that nowadays I want to buy the leader in that space. I'm trying to move towards the leader in that space. That's what everyone else is trying to do right now. But I'm very mindful of two things. Number one, valuation always makes sense. But when the company is small, even at a high valuation, it can have a very fast run rate at forward. When the company is large, it makes a big difference, the valuation there. When the, so I'll repeat that. When the company is small, the valuation isn't as important. Something that's priced at, let's say, 5 billion market cap, it can be priced at 15 times forward sales. It can be priced at 5 times forward sales. It doesn't make so much difference. When the company is priced at 200 billion market cap, and you're buying it at, let's say, at 20 times forward sales, you have to kind of be willing to believe that it's going to be a kind of half a trillion dollar company. It's kind of like more difficult. So you're saying what, that because one has a longer runway than the other. Yeah, it's kind of difficult, you know. I mean, when a company is so large, it's, it's, it's difficult. I know that we all know those mega caps that, that are doing that, but it's difficult. And they keep growing and growing and growing. But yeah, you're right. Yes, absolutely. But as an investor right now, I am, I'm, I'm trying to kind of front load my investment into that company over the period of, let's say, six months or so. I'm kind of trying to deploy the capital, but I'm not in the ideal situation. I'm not looking in a year and a half time to put more capital. I'm looking to start to exit that position. 
So I need that 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 investment thesis to work out favorably over over about a year and a half for me to start to see validation. And I wouldn't be in a year and a half time really necessarily looking to add more to a position because I work quite hard. So I, I always have a, 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 a many ideas coming to me all the time. Even over the weekend, people write to me, oh, Michael, have you looked at X, Y, Z? So I have just a run rate of ideas. Like ideas, I got more ideas than I have capital. So that's not a huge problem for me. So at this moment in time, I'm just looking to average up over the last next, say, two, three months, five months out. But I, I, I don't want to be averaging up too high, but I do want to let that position run. I want to let that, that compounding work for me. And I don't want to be touching that position if it's doing well. I, I want to leave it as it is. I've got plenty of losers in my portfolio. So it'll, <laughs> I will look to exit those positions instead. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very um, interesting um, idea of this about uh, how, how to kind of, uh, how to invest and how to position size. Uh, I'm kind of mindful as well of the time here. Uh, I don't want to kind of uh, run over too much. Um, Let's wrap it up. Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, I think we should wrap it up. I think that uh, I'm quite excited. That, well, we discussed a lot of different things about position sizing. And uh, if I'll, when we put it out there, if anyone kind of wants to know what kind of things, maybe drop us a, a question or something that they're interested in. Would you like to wrap up with anything, Manuel? Yeah, uh, let me just tell our viewers that one day, well, our, our initial um, thought was to make this live and we're going to try and make this live uh, like on YouTube and for you guys to be able to ask questions in real time and get answers or opinions in real time. We've had some technical difficulties. And if someone that, that is listening to this has any any experience uh, on, on broadcasting live to YouTube, two people uh, at the same time, please let us know. Uh, but when we get that um, figured out, we're going to do it this live. So it's going to be much better when we get also when we get the following um, to, to answer questions and make this more dynamic. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.